So in this lesson, we'll be looking at the impact of World War I on Canadians who lived in Canada during the war. Although thousands of Canadians fought overseas, the vast majority of Canadians felt the effects of the war from here. Even though the war never reached Canadian soil, World War I had an immense impact on the nature of Canadian society. And so to learn about this, we're going to do a brief overview of some of the ways that the war impacted those who lived in Canada at the time. And we're going to look at four major areas that it did this. We're going to look at the contributions of women to the war effort on the home front. We're going to look at the introduction of the War Measures Act. We're going to see the effects of the conscription crisis. And then finally, we'll look at the impact of the Halifax explosion. Now, in order to understand how society functions and how major events can impact it, we can sort of think of what society is like in Canada today. And so we can think of what are some of the major characteristics that define our society today. We can think of the major impacts that uh, define our society. We can think of things like uh, the election of our prime minister or world events that impact us here in Canada. We can think of the rights and freedoms that we enjoy here in Canada. We can think about normal or common behaviors, sort of what is within the accepted social norm in Canada. We can think of the ideals and values that we hold. And although we kind of accept these things as being true and being evident, um, these are not things that are static in time. These are things that change over time. They're things that are influenced by where we live and when we live. And for people who lived 100 years ago, these would have been drastically different. The events that impacted them would have been different. The rights and freedoms that they had would have been different. What would have been considered normal behavior would have been different. And the ideals and values that Canadians held would have been different. So in order to understand why people thought the way they did back then, it's necessary to look at what was going on in the world at the time. So what was going on in the 1910s that affected Canadian society? Well, World War I was the big driving factor that was sort of influencing the way the society played out. So war broke out in August 1914 and lasted until an armistice was called on November 11, 1918. Now, as part of the British Empire, Canada was part of the Triple Entente, fighting the Triple Alliance, and Canada had no say in the declaration of war. Once Britain was at war, that meant Canada was at war too. We had no say over this. We didn't get to take a vote in Parliament. Canada had to go along with this because Britain said so. We are part of the British Empire and did not have any control over that decision. Most of the fighting during the war took place on the Western Front, between France and Belgium, and the Eastern Front, which was in Russia. Even though the war was on a different continent, though, it had a major impact on Canadian society. So what we're going to do in this lesson today is we're going to look at what some of these impacts were. Now, the first major impact is we had all these men leaving to go fight in the war. Uh, many men were initially excited for the war and signed up in record numbers. When war was declared, there was, again, mad rushes of men who went to go sign up uh, to voluntarily fight for the ar for, uh, fight in the armed services. This was seen as a heroic thing. Many men thought it was an adventure. They were all for this. So there was a feeling of excitement towards going to fight in the war. Now, back then, Canada had a population of only 7.2 million people, but 600,000 people participated directly in the war effort. So that's close to 10% of Canada's population that had a direct hand in fighting this war. That's a huge percentage. Most of these people were men, though, as women were not allowed to enlist as soldiers. So the main contribution that women had on the home was on the home front. Women were left at home and started to perform duties that had previously they had not been allowed to do. Women did jobs such as working in munitions factories, they drove streetcars and buses, they worked in banks, they worked in police forces, and they worked in civil service jobs. And they also tended to the farms of those of their husbands who had gone off to fight in the war. Now, because of their increased role in Canadian society, many women began to demand more equal rights. Now, one of these movements was called the suffragist movement. This is where women began to demand the right to vote in elections. And because of their service in the Great War, doing these jobs on the home front, women began to have a louder voice. This, uh, the suffragist movement by no means did not start with World War I. Um, Again, these, these sort of movements have been around for a while at this point. 
because women were playing a greater role in Canadian society, um, this sort of gave more fuel to their claims. It helped give those claims more legitimacy, and politicians began to see women as an important coalition that could help them um, politically. And in 1917, Prime Minister Robert Borden allowed women who had a relative in the war the right to vote in federal elections. Now, at the time, again, this is not all women who are getting the right to vote. This is only women who direct relatives are off fighting in the war. And sort of the justification that they were using at the time was that they were voting essentially uh, in place of their relative. So this was a bit of a compromise that was being made here. And also Borden is giving this vote to women whose, um, whose husbands are off fighting in the war. They're a lot more likely to support Borden in the war. We'll see why in a second. Um, by 1919, however, all women over the age of 21 were given the right to vote. Again, this was a very controversial thing at the time. Before then, women were not allowed to vote. Um, and sort of, today this seems like a crazy idea, but back then, uh, women were not treated equally to men in the same way. Politics was seen as the realm of men. Um, and in fact, some of the arguments against the suffragists, were, some were saying, you know, if we give women the right to vote, in a sense it's like giving their husbands two votes, because their husbands will just tell women what to do. So we see some of these misogynistic views. Um, that sort of infiltrated politics at the time, thinking that men were the only ones who could understand politics, that politics was too dirty of a business for women to get involved with. Um, this was, again, when we start to see women overcoming those barriers and being given more equal access to the political realm through the right to vote. And this is sort of the first step in that um, with only those who had a relative overseas, but this very quickly leads to all women getting the right to vote. Now, the war also affected Canadian society by challenging the rights that Canadians had. And so one way that we saw this was with the War Measures Act. Now, the War Measures Act was passed unopposed in 1914, and it allowed the Prime Minister to pass a bill without going through Parliament. Now, as the Prime Minister, what types of things could you control if you were able to enact the War Measures Act? Well, this actually gave the Prime Minister a lot of power. Um, now you don't have to worry about making a bill that's popular or making a bill that you can get your constituents, your MPs, to vote for and your constituents to support. You can just do whatever you want. So this allowed the Prime Minister to suspend the rights of many Canadians. So this affected many different groups of people. We could see this in terms of enemy aliens. So enemy aliens are people whose heritage was from an enemy country, such as Germany. And as a result, they had their movements closely controlled. Again, the idea here was that there was a suspicion of these people, that you know they could, there could be spies amongst them. Um, so anyone seen as being a sympathizer could be arrested and deported or put into an internment camp. So what we see here in this picture is a group of German men or other Eastern European men who are working at a, uh, in, a, in a work camp. They've been put here, they're doing work in this internment camp um, because they've been suspected of being German sympathizers. Now, again, many of these men had come from Eastern Europe in the early 1900s. They might have been recent immigrants. Some of them, maybe their parents came over. Uh, and a lot of these Eastern European men came over in the early 1900s to settle the West. A lot of them had been lured to Canada with promises of new freedoms and free land to farm upon. So what we want to think, is it fair to take away the rights of these men just because of where they came from? Um, again, they don't necess they didn't necessarily show any signs that they were sympathizing with Germany or that they were spies. It was simply based on their heritage that they were having their rights taken away from them. The War Measures Act also gave the government sweeping powers in other areas. This gave the government immense powers of censorship. So censorship is the government's ability to closely control information. So they could do this through the control of the media. They were able to censor what news reports got out. So again, trying to control the information that the public is able to consume in order to shape public opinion. This also gave the government the power to control industry. It gave the government the power to seize control of any business or factory and change it so that it produced products needed for the war. So you might take control of a factory that made industrial parts and you might turn that into a factory that makes bombs or makes guns or makes tanks. So now you're controlling industry and you're directing them towards the war effort. Another immense impact of the war on Canadians was with conscription. 
Now, what is conscription? Conscription is the compulsory enlistment of citizens for military service. And what this meant was any male between the age of 18 to 45 could be drafted and forced to fight in the armed services. Now, this was a controversial issue in Canada. Again, the draft is a very controversial idea. Or should the government have the right to draft citizens and force them to fight for the government in an army? Not everyone agreed that the government could do this. There were many different groups that opposed the government's uh, ability to enact conscription. So this included, included groups like pacifists. Pacifists are those who object to war. They don't think it should be used to resolve international disputes, or they might object to the use of violence on a moral ground. There were also some members of the clergy who objected because of religious reasons. Some farmers objected to conscription because they were worried about its effect on farms and the ability to provide food for the war effort. And another major group that opposed conscription was French Canadians. And we saw this issue play out in the 1917 federal election. Now, this was an election fought between these two men here, the man on the left, the incumbent prime minister, Robert Borden, and the man on the right, former Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier. Now, Borden ran on a platform that was in support of conscription. And unlike many other elections, the 1917 election was almost solely fought based on this one issue. When you went to the polls to vote, it was less so that you were voting for Borden or Laurier. It was more were you voting for or against conscription. That was really the only big issue that they were fighting for at the time. Now, what you can see on this map here on the right, this is how the vote ended up turning out. Now, Borden won a majority of the popular vote in Canada. He won about 55% of the vote. And he won the popular vote in almost every province. However, there's one major province that he did not win, which was Quebec, which Borden lost by a huge margin. French Canadians widely opposed conscription. But because Borden won the election, the government was able to pass this law. They were able to bring conscription into effect. And many French Canadians were not happy with this because they voted against this and they felt like it was English Canada imposing their will upon the French. And there's a whole history of French-English relations that goes back hundreds of years before this. And many French Canadians felt like this was that same thing playing out again where English Canada was taking advantage of French Canada, trying to impose their will upon them. Uh, so for a long time, this was sort of held against um, Borden and the Conservatives by those who lived in Quebec. Now, although tens of thousands were conscripted in the following year, very few actually made their way to the battlefield, and even fewer saw combat time. But again, it's important to remember, again, what this meant, that the government was allowed to conscript soldiers uh, into, the, into the armed forces without their permission. So no longer were they relying on volunteer forces, they were taking men and forcing them to join the army. And the final aspect of the war that we're going to look at here today will be the effects of the Halifax Explosion. Now, during the war, and for long before the war as well, Halifax was a very important shipping and naval port. There was lots of ship traffic, both civilian and military, during the war. However, Halifax Harbor is relatively narrow, so its geography complicates shipping to a very huge degree. And on December 6, 1917, there was a tragedy involved because of that. So two ships, the Imo and the Mont Blanc, collided in Halifax Harbor, causing a massive explosion. The Mont Blanc was a military ship carrying a cargo full of high explosives en route to France. And the collision set off an explosion the equivalent to 2.9 kilotons of TNT. This was a massive explosion, the largest man-made explosion in history at that point. And it's still the largest non-nuclear man-made explosion in human history. As a result of the Halifax explosion, 2,000 people were killed and over 9,000 were injured. And so why is it important to think about this event? Again, the war was not fought in Canada. There was no fighting on Canadian soil. But the Halifax explosion kind of brought home the horrors of war to many Canadians. Um, again, because these were ships that were um, trying to support the war effort, all these explosives, they're going overseas, and they all blow up in the harbor, and they kill thousands of people. 
Um, so this has an impact on many Canadians and sort of brings home what those horrors are like. It's one thing to read about a war that's going on overseas and sending men over to fight for a cause. But when you see the death and destruction on your doorstep, even if this isn't directly related to the war, even though this wasn't an enemy force attacking Halifax, it still brought home a lot of those realities to many people. And so in summary, even though no fighting took place on Canadian soil, World War I had an immense impact on Canadian society. Women played an important role in wartime industries and fought for the right to vote. The federal government introduced the War Measures Act in order to suspend many civil rights. When volunteer levels dropped, the government introduced conscription, the forced drafting of men into the armed services. This measure was highly unpopular in French Canada. And although Canada was not attacked during the war, the Halifax explosion was a deadly reminder of the cost of war to Canadians.